going to give a quick overview of Denk Sharding. Um, there's a more in-depth session this afternoon for those uh, who want to learn uh, more in detail about it. So um, data shards. Um, uh, this is uh, the idea of data shards is to provide data availability for rollups. Um, the meaning of the data is no longer de defined by the consensus layer, but instead uh, will be defined in the application layer and um, Ethereum base layer consensus in the future uh, will have uh, no responsibility other than ensuring that this data is available. And uh, why have we changed um, this from the original plan uh, several years ago, which was execution sharding? Well, uh, we know that rollups are about 100 times more efficient than native execution, so it's hard to see that execution shards would ever be um, in high demand. So our goal is to provide about 1.3 megabytes per second of data availability um, with the full sharding rollup, um, and uh, this is... Uh, about 10x the current max capacity or like 200 times the typical capacity of the current Ethereum base layer. And this has been um, the Ethereum target since um, roughly late uh, 2019. Um, how do we construct such a data availability layer? Um, well, the, the basis is a technique called data availability sampling, um, because in order to scale, we need some way of ensuring that data is available uh, that scales, that doesn't mean, like, that means that uh, full nodes do not need to download all the data. So in some way, we need to be sure that O of N data is available using just O of 1 work. And uh, the idea is, behind this, is we distribute the data into N chunks, and each download, uh, each node only downloads K randomly selected chunks. So this is the idea of data availability sampling the client. Um, picks a few random chunks and uh, downloads those instead of downloading the full data. Um, but we need a way uh, to deal with the case where uh, some of the chunks are missing and those might not be the ones you're sampling. So if you just do this, um, that doesn't give you good security because one chunk missing could still be very important data. So the only way that this works securely is um, if we employ a te technique uh, that's called erasure coding. So what we do is we have to extend the data using a so-called Reed solomon code, um, and uh, that's just a fancy word for polynomial interpolation. And so what you do is um, you take the data, um, you put a, a polynomial through the original data, which is indicated by the blue boxes here, um, and uh, you, you evaluate that polynomial at um, the same number posi of positions again. And then like using elementary polynomial maths, we know like with any, um, uh, like for example in this case, it would be a polynomial of degree three because we have four data points. And then with any four of these data points, no matter which ones they are, we know that we can always reconstruct 100% of, um, of all the data. So we can know what exactly the polynomial was. And this means we have, uh, we have changed the problem from, from uh, ensuring that all these chunks are available to the problem that knowing that the 50%, at least 50% of the chunks are available. Um, and uh, this is the basis of why the sampling becomes uh, efficient because, for example, now acquiring 30 random blocks um, is enough to make sure that the data is, uh, the, the probability of the data being unavailable is less than 2 to the minus 30. So that's, that's really nice. Um, but uh, yeah, one of the problems this poses is now we need to uh, know that this encoding is correct. And um, to the rescue comes what uh, Ben just introduced, uh, KZG commitments. Uh, so the way um, KZG pro commitments solve this is because KZG commitments can only commit to polynomials. Um, so uh, if we did the same thing, if we tried to do this with Merkle trees, we'd always have this question, well, now like you have a Merkle tree of uh, some data, but uh, what, what if someone just didn't encode a polynomial, but instead just uh, encoded random garbage, and, um, and now, yeah, you, can, you cannot reconstruct it, right? So everyone, everyone has different samples, and um, what they reconstruct is not the same data. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't have consensus on what the data is. Um, and so uh, you can solve that with polynomial commitments, because then you know that everyone um, will always uh, get the same polynomial, and everyone will always be able to um, reconstruct uh, the data. Um, so, 
uh, what, what has changed uh, with uh, what's now called dank sharding. So the, um, the original uh, sharding proposal, as we had it previously, uh, was based on having um, lots of parallel running shard chains um, that would all have independent proposers. So um, each shard um, has, a, has a proposer, and then uh, there's a committee for each of those shards that um, does sort of a first pass check on, uh, on whether that shard data that uh, someone proposed um, was actually available. And um, the problem with that construction is that, uh, well, ideally, you want to know in the next beacon block, um, as in like the next, uh, for example, that would also contain the next um, Ethereum L1 execution block, um, uh, you would want to know whether that uh, data was available or not so that you can start building it. For example, like the rollup can include the new state route. Um, however, um, with, uh, with all these different proposals, um, this is hard to achieve because you would have to rely on being able to get all these messages, all these votes on whether the data was available within one slot, and that would uh, impose very tight constraints that we are not confident that uh, can always be fulfilled um, on the network. Um, so uh, with the new design that uh, um, is now uh, called dank sharding, uh, what we do instead is we have um, uh, one proposer who proposes the beacon block and all the shard blocks. Um, and uh, the reason that we can do this is that uh, uh, we nowadays, uh, we use a technique called a proposer builder separation uh, where not, uh, where basically normal consensus participants like uh, for example, uh, current ETH2 validators uh, do not have to be able to co actually construct blocks. They can outsource this, they can basically, there's a bidding process where some entities that are capable of producing these blocks uh, will make bids and, uh, um, and the, the ETH2 validators role is only uh, to select the highest bidding among these and, uh, and select their block basically. Uh, and the nice thing is now we have a single ent entity that's responsible for creating this whole block that includes um, the, the L1 execution block, the beacon block, uh, and all the shard data. And thus we can verify whether it was available or not in aggregate. Like that wasn't possible before because here there are different proposers. So we cannot simply uh, rely, like if we said, oh, if one of them is not available, we just say everything's not available, then that would be unfair to those who've actually done their work properly and actually made it available. Whereas, versus if there's someone responsible for making everything uh, available, then that's fine. Like we can just uh, punish them in aggregate if they fail to do any of their work. Um, yeah, and this is an illustration how this would work for proposer builder separation. So what happens is you have a, a proposer block um, which selects the beacon block, and that would be small. And then like this actual uh, main block with all the um, payload and uh, and the chart data uh, would be created by a builder in a separate block. Um, so one of the essential um, components uh, of this construction um, is the uh, two-dimensional scheme. So we've had before Ben introduced KCG commitments, um, and um, and uh, we uh, we can use them to commit to polynomials. And uh, one possible approach would be to just uh, commit to uh, all the data that we want to avail make available, um, 16 to uh, 32 megabytes uh, per block, in one KCG commitment. However, that has certain disadvantages in particular if not all of the data is available, then someone would have to interpolate a polynomial um, of this big size. Like um, That would be like a very, very big polynomial, and that's actually a lot of work. Um, and uh, so um, in order to avoid this problem, um, what we instead do is we, uh, we split the data into, into a square of data, and we commit to each row using one KCG commitment. And then we interpolate, we extend this in the rows, but we also extend the columns. So we compute, um, we compute again the same number of KZG commitments, and now the whole thing is basically a two-dimensional polynomial on a square. Um, and, uh, and that has certain advantages. In particular, it means that each row and each column individually can be reconstructed. So like there's, uh, in order to reconstruct the data, you do not need one actor who's able to download all the data. You only need actors who are able to um, download full rows and full columns. And so that's, uh, uh, that's much better. Like the, assum the, the assumptions that we need to make on uh, who is present on the network are now much lower. 
Um, and, um, and this also has another nice advantage, which is that um, we, we have a much better properties in terms of validation. So like um, what, uh, what we intend to do is that um, each validator um, is responsible for checking uh, two rows and two columns. And we have the property with this 2D square uh, that basically if at least 50% of the rows or 50% of the columns are fully available, then everything is available. Like then you can reconstruct everything. That's the property of this polynomial reconstruction. Um, so basically, um, with this, like let's say that um, less than 50% of the rows and less than 50% of the columns are un unavailable uh, are available, which that that would be required in order to like fail the data availability. Then uh, then the probability that some that a random validator votes for this is actually really low. It's uh, two to the uh, minus four, so it's one one sixteen. So any unavailable block can get at most one sixteenth of the votes. So it's um, uh, under normal conditions, it cannot pass. Uh, it cannot become um, uh, the uh, the canonical chain. Um, and uh, the second nice property of this is that uh, we can use the validator set um, for, for reconstructing unavailable data. So um, because we have overlap between rows and columns, um, uh, validators can, can use what they sample in order to fill in the gaps. Um, so basically, like if, uh, so if, if, you, if any, everyone only downloaded rows, for example, and only 50% of the rows are available, then basically we would have no way of filling in the remaining 50%. Um, like basically they would always remain unavailable. But um, because every validator uh, has um, compute some, like uh, download some rows and some columns, um, there would always be some overlap. So basically if 50% of the rows are available, then we can, we can actually get all of the columns like basically like um, it would be enough to reconstruct the columns and then from the columns we can reconstruct the missing rows so that's nice that uh, provides um, distributed reconstruction and uh, finally what it also provides directly is uh, data availability sampling which is the thing i started with so um, that's uh, um, the, our safety against malicious uh, uh, majorities, so even in case the validator set became entirely, or like, well, uh, a majority of it became evil and they tried to uh, publish a, um, uh, a shard block that's unavailable, um, they would not be able to get through with it because what full nodes do is they, uh, they pick these random samples um, and, uh, and check that they're available. And um, uh, in this case, so it's changed before it was uh, in, on, in a one-dimensional polynomial, you need to check about 30 samples um, uh, because 50% fi is enough to reconstruct. However, um, for a two-dimensional polynomial, it's a bit different because you need to be sure that at least three-quarters of the data is available, so you now need to do 75 random samples um, on this whole square. Um, but uh, um, but that's still very, a very scalable technique. So for example, if you compute the bandwidth required to do this, each sample is 512 bytes. So if you do 75 samples um, in 16 seconds, that's only an average bandwidth of 2.5 kilobytes per second. So that's a very sca scalable technique and uh, very powerful. Yeah. And yeah, that's it. That's a rough overview of what comes with Denk sharding. And um, yeah, hope to see some of you on the, in the session later today.